All right, we are good to go. Okay, Chair Carlton, um, we have regrets from Councillor Hutchinson and uh, Councillor Woodbury has not joined us yet, but you do have quorum, so I'll pass the meeting over to you. Excellent, thank you very much, Heather. So I will call the meeting to order at 9.32. If there's any declaration of interest, you may declare at any time throughout the meeting. And we're on to the report PDR CCTF 10-22. And I'm assuming everyone has read that long recommendation, so I'm not going to read the whole thing out loud. And I will turn it over to Randy and Linda then. Great. Um, so I think I'm going to walk everyone through the presentation this morning. Uh, and then Randy and I are, of course, along with Kim, happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have either about the presentation or the report. So I will share my screen. Uh, so thank you for, for your time this morning. Um, we have a fair amount uh, of content to cover. So just a little overview of what I'm going to be walking you through. Uh, a little bit of the Climate Change Action Plan project history. Uh, how we are meeting the Partners for Climate Protection milestones. Some of the components that went into developing the climate action plan that we're presenting today for your consideration. And then a summary of recent activities that are already underway along with some next steps. So in terms of the project history, uh, all of you uh, were here for all of this, whereas I've only been part of this since last summer, but back in 2018, the official plan identified a need for a climate action plan. And through a competitive procurement, we were able to retain ICLE Canada to support us as climate action planning experts. Uh, the climate change task force yourselves were convened in early 2020 and have been guiding the process since then, which has included an initial phase of public and state Holder engagement uh, to develop a draft plan that you received in July of 2021. Uh, and then a second phase of public and stakeholder engagement where we sought comments and feedback on that draft. Uh, and you'll recall that in December, I, I shared with you the findings of that engagement program. And since then, we've worked uh, with a variety of stakeholders to update the plan to reflect the, the recommendations and advice that we heard through that second engagement process. Um, what is in front of you today is what we hope is the final plan, uh, which reflects the best advice from ICLE Canada, along with the really um, important insights that we heard from local residents, businesses, and stakeholders about how the plan could best reflect a made in gray approach to climate action. Having signed up for the Partners for Climate Protection program, they present a five milestone framework. Uh, and if this plan is adopted, Gray County will have achieved the first of those three milestones. Uh, so ICLE Canada has ensured that what has been prepared conforms to the requirements from the Partners for Climate Protection. So it would put us in great standing to then move forward with implementation and monitoring. In addition to yourselves as the climate change task force who've been strategically guiding uh, the work that's gone into this plan, there are a number of other advisory tables uh, that have, have been part of this all along the way. Uh, one is an external working group that uh, we at the county co-chair with the Grey Bruce Public Health Unit. Uh, another is an internal working group. So that's county staff who've looked over the entire plan to make sure that it, it's feasible within what they're doing in their own work programs. And then recently last fall, we also convened a municipal community of practice. So uh, the county of course has a, a role in coordinating and advancing the climate action agenda, uh, but nothing will be possible without close collaboration with all of our member municipalities. Uh, and so in terms of elected representatives, of course, that guidance comes from yourselves and county council. And then at the staff level, each municipality has identified a, a lead staff person and we meet monthly to share kind of technical best practices on how we can move forward with implementing the guidance we receive. So the first milestone of the PCC process is 
undertaking a greenhouse gas inventory. Uh, so this is really uh, the accounting. So you could think of this almost the same way we have our, our financial budget. Uh, there's also an approach to climate change where we try to create a greenhouse gas budget and, and ledger. And so in this process, we try to understand where greenhouse gas emissions are coming from locally. Uh, and so there's a few important points here because of course, uh, not everything we consume in Gray County is produced locally uh, and not everything that we produce locally is consumed in Gray County. Uh, and so the terms scope one, two, three are not really important, but really this kind of shows us where the boundary is drawn around our emissions. And so anything that is produced in the geographic boundary of Gray County or happens here is counted. So the, the emissions from cars that are driven within Gray County, um, the emissions that come from heating our buildings, um, anything connected to local agriculture, that's all counted regardless of where any pr products we produce may be consumed. Um, so if we're manufacturing something here and it's being shipped elsewhere, we have to count those emissions. But on the flip side, all of the emissions associated with things we consume here, so our electronics, or if you're buying a car from overseas, those emissions are, are attributed to those other locations. Um, so it's just a snapshot of the locally generated emissions. Uh, and also that scope two shows that any electricity that we're using locally is also counted. So, you know, it might be coming from a power plant outside of Gray County, but we still have to be accountable for those emissions. So um, we made a couple of changes uh, from the draft action plan to the current action plan in response to feedback. And one of them was to separate out fossil fuel greenhouse gas emissions um, from the term biogenic <laughs> greenhouse gas emissions. And that just means emissions that come uh, from, from natural sources. So things like decomposition of waste, uh, or agriculture. And we thought this was important because the kind of responses needed for fossil fuel emissions and biogenic emissions are different. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we, we made clear that these were two different types of emissions. Uh, and what you see on these graphs is that about 60% of our local emissions come from fossil fuels. So the, the burning of natural gas, of gasoline, of diesel, um, propane, things we're using to, to move around or to heat our homes. And then the other 40% do come from those biogenic sources. And the kind of three biggest areas of opportunity um, in terms of sources of emissions locally are really transportation. So that's these private vehicles, um, our buildings, so our residential and commercial buildings. So that's sort of about uh, almost 30% there and then agriculture. So most of our biogenic emissions locally are coming from agriculture. Only about 13% are coming from our solid waste management. Um, and so we use this to really just understand where there are opportunities for us to, to make a difference and make a change. Uh, we also did an analysis of Gray County's corporate emissions. So the emissions that come from Gray County owned assets make up less than 1% of overall emissions. So it's not a significant amount of emissions, but it is an opportunity for, for Gray County to really lead by example with our own assets. So making sure that we're doing everything we can within our own operations to, to reduce our emissions profile. Um, and so what you see here is that for us, most of our emissions are coming from buildings, uh, but also, you know, almost 40% are coming from our fleets and equipment. And then within those 60% of buildings emissions, most over 80% are coming from our housing stock. Um, so again, just a way to understand where our greatest areas of opportunity are in terms of emissions reduction. So having tried to understand where all our emissions come from, uh, we then move forward with a process to set targets. Uh, and the targets that are in front of you today are the following. So one is a corporate target where we're seeking to reduce the corporate operational emissions by 40% by 2030 and to achieve net zero corporate emissions by 2050. Uh, and I should note, when we talk about corporate assets, it really is only county-owned assets. So for a municipality that, that owns a town hall or owns a building or a fleet, those emissions are not part of the county's corporate 
inventory. Those would fall to the municipal corporate inventory. And then in terms of community targets, we're looking at a 30% reduction by 2030 relative to 2018 levels. And again, a net zero uh, emissions level by 2050. So you can see that our corporate emissions target is that little bit more ambitious uh, than our community target, again, in an effort to, to demonstrate what's possible and show that we're really trying to walk the talk in terms of emissions reduction. So to land on these targets, uh, we did a scan of the targets being set uh, elsewhere because we wanted to make sure that what we were looking at made sense. And so what you see here are the community emission reduction targets of various jurisdictions across Canada. Uh, so you can see that two of our neighbors, both Dufferin and Wellington, have, have set net zero by 2050 targets. Uh, some municipalities like Halton Hills uh, have, have decided to be incredibly ambitious and they're seeking to achieve net zero emissions by 2030. Uh, and then you see a number of other levels of ambition from Durham and Waterloo Region. Um, uh, London has proposed a 55% a, a reduction by 2030. Um, and Toronto a uh, 65 by 2030 and a net zero by 2040. But I do want to draw your attention to both the federal and provincial targets, because of course we're kind of nested within those other orders of government. And in June of 2021, the federal government actually set uh, or actually adopted the Net Zero Accountability Act. So really enshrining into to legislation that Canada nationally will achieve net zero emissions by 2050 and is seeking to achieve between 40 and 45 percent reductions by 2030. So the targets that are being proposed for Gray County really, really nest within these targets that have been set by our higher orders of government and are comparable to many of our peers. So having set the targets and understood where the emissions are coming from, we then set about developing a plan. Um, and a cornerstone of this was a series of engagement. And I'm not gonna spend too long on this as we spoke about this in depth in December, but really to say we did outreach to various sectors. We had an online survey in the initial phases of engagement with over 200 responses. We had a dedicated online survey specifically for the agricultural sector. Uh, and then through the phase two of engagement, we had a number of both in-person uh, town hall style meetings, as well as inviting and receiving a cross sector of written submissions from stakeholders. Uh, and from all this, we did derive these 11 core engagement findings. Uh, and this was really what guided us in the updates of the plan that's in front of you. So we heard clearly the desire to set ambitious targets aligned with the federal net zero goal, to pay more attention to nature-based solutions, uh, and to set a clear prioritization of actions, which is something you'll have seen in the report we took very seriously. Uh, there's a number of recommendations around updating the plan as we go forward, uh, making sure the county shows leadership, uh, and centering reconciliation and climate action. There was also the importance of agriculture that was highlighted, our emerging energy innovation sector, and the desire to recognize that though this plan is focused on local greenhouse gas emissions, where we can, we should be also looking at life cycle emissions. Uh, and then finally, the importance of engagement and communication in moving forward. So we really tried to respond to these uh, recommendations in the updated plan in front of you. And you'll see early on in the plan, a recognition of the importance of reconciliation in particular. So knowing that there's a long history of environmental stewardship uh, from local indigenous communities, particularly the Saudi Ojibwe uh, nation uh, or San, we really wanted to make sure that we were clear in stating the intention of this plan to be implemented in partnership uh, with these original stewards of the land. Um, and then beyond that overarching intention, we also identified 21 activities. Um, so I'm not gonna walk through all of them, but we said of these 21 activities, the good news was that 13 of them are in fact already underway. Uh, 
Um, so this is not stuff that the county has not previously, you know, hasn't been aware of. Um, there are programs already in place, both at the county and municipally that are advancing many of these, these pieces. And so the blue actions are all things that are already initiated. But there were a few actions and areas where we thought there was an opportunity and a need to initiate a new program. And of those, uh, you'll see there's, there's eight new initiatives that are highlighted in green. When you add all these initiatives together, based on ICLEI's analysis, it is possible to put us on a path towards our net zero target. And so what this slide illustrates, which is also in the report, is the relative greenhouse gas emissions reduction potential um, of each of these actions. And you can see that some actions uh, offer a greater or lesser emission reduction, and that was part of the, the information we used in our prioritization. Uh, but also of the 21 actions, some are enablers. And so we need to recognize that it may not be possible to put a GHG number on it, but it's still very important for us to reach that overall goal. Wanting to respond to the direction uh, through the engagement to prioritize action, we know that all 21 activities are necessary, but we can't start them all at once and we can't do them all at once. We need to understand where, where to initiate things based on the areas of greatest opportunity. Um, so we looked at four prioritization criteria. One is the relative greenhouse gas emissions reduction potential shown on the last slide. The second is the cost to implement. Um, where can we get our biggest bang for the buck um, in terms of investments? The third is community benefits. So where is there an opportunity to deliver um, other benefits to our residents and businesses beyond just greenhouse gas emission reduction? Uh, and the fourth is the level of county influence. There may be something that has a huge amount of potential but is not directly within the county's purview or, or areas of, of influence. And so that was something we considered. And what you see on this slide is a, a pull out from section eight of the plan that for each action identifies these different um, pieces of information in terms of the relative cost, the relative greenhouse gas emission reduction potential, and in this instance, the resilience co-benefits. So based on those criteria, we, we undertook a prioritized act exercise and a number of things emerged. So the, four, the first is this idea of four foundational pillars. So these are four actions recommended in the plan that are already underway. Um, so these are things that it is really important that we continue and expand upon. Um, and what you see here on this slide is that by continuing and expanding these four actions, we have the potential to achieve 40% of our cumulative emission reduction. So these are really big areas of opportunity. Um, in terms of the afforestation, uh, number one, and habitat and wetland protection, Gray County is really blessed with an abundance of natural assets that are invaluable to us, both from a climate perspective and for the many other benefits they bring to our community. Um, with over 8,500 acres of forest, there's really a potential here to, to use this, this natural, natural asset to be a key part of our overall greenhouse gas reduction program. Um, and this is something that was also identified uh, in a report released just yesterday by the International Panel on Climate Change that nature-based solutions really need to be a big part of our climate change response. Uh, along those lines, number three, capacity building in agriculture, we absolutely saw through this analysis that our agricultural community is a partner uh, in responding to the climate crisis. This is something where they are 100% part of the solution, uh, and there's huge opportunities. Um, it's actually one of the largest areas of opportunity in terms of soil sequestration uh, for carbon, carbon emissions. Similarly, by continuing and expanding our waste and organic diversion program, uh, there's a significant climate action benefit. And then finally, of the four foundational pillars is to make sure that the, the accelerated growth that is happening in Gray County happens in a complete, compact, and mixed-use way. Um, if we're building communities that enable people to, to walk, to enable people to run errands quickly uh, close to their homes in, in our settlement areas, that is absolutely the foundation of a low carbon and low emissions path going forwards. 
In addition to those four foundational pillars, we also identified five new initiatives or five key next steps that we need to do to put us on that net zero pathway. Uh, the first is to develop, to, develop a green, to develop a green development standard uh, with our member municipalities. Um, the, the cheapest and easiest way to build a low carbon building is, is when, you, when you do it the first time. We wanna make sure that the new development that's happening is happening in a way that aligns with Gray County's vision uh, for a sustainable and low carbon future. Uh, the second program we identified is a residential retrofit program. Uh, so we know that, that energy poverty affects many residents in Gray County. Uh, and so this is an opportunity both to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by developing a program to support home, home energy retrofits uh, and also increase the affordability for our residents by enabling them to reduce their utility bills. Uh, there's also significant federal federal funding for home energy retrofit programs. Uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities has earmarked $300 million specifically for the development and implementation of this kind of work. Accelerating zero emissions transportation. Um, so you saw in those initial slides that transportation is the largest source of fossil fuel emissions in our area. And that makes sense given our rural and lower density uh, development patterns. Um, and so we need to make sure that that transportation, when it does need to be long distance, when things can't be walked or cycled, it's happening in a zero emissions way. Uh, and so that comes through enabling the installation of electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Uh, and similarly, there's significant federal funding. A new intake is going to be announced this spring from the zero emissions infrastructure funding program. Um, and so that's something that we can seek out. The fourth key next step is to develop a climate adaptation plan. The plan in front of you today really focus on, focuses on reducing our local greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I heard someone describe it um, as if you're in a bathtub and it's overflowing, the first thing you need to do is turn off the tap. Uh, and then you can start focusing on how you mop up uh, all the spilled water. And so I think this plan is about turning off the tap that's in front of you today, but then we do of course have to recognize that our climate is already changing and what are we going to do to adapt to that changing climate? And then the final of the next key steps is a community or a climate action engagement program. So I, the role, uh, one of the roles of the county is to create an environment that enables our residents and businesses to make sustainable choices, but we also need to make sure that they have the information and tools uh, to be thinking about how they as, as individuals can make choices that are aligned with this sustainable vision for our region. So overall, when combined, uh, this slide just shows what the potential reductions are. And I think uh, it's important to note that overall, there is this 84% reduction in emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, but you also see a 61% reduction in energy consumption. So this isn't just a lower carbon pathway that's being presented or a lower greenhouse gas emissions pathway. It's also a more efficient pathway. And that efficiency results in cost savings. So what we're seeing across Gray County would be a savings of 41% in energy costs if these low carbon actions were all realized. And that results in over between now and 2050, over $2 billion in cost savings to our community, which is of course significant. On the corporate side of things, and this is much shorter, um, there are four themes that we've identified for our actions um, that align with those areas of opportunity I spoke to at the beginning of the presentation. One is around retrofitting our buildings and our lighting. Uh, the second is around our fleet and equipment, uh, reducing waste. And then finally, and I mean, I don't think, you know, it's not even gonna show up on the wedges because it is one of those enablers is trying to create a municipal culture of conservation and sustainability. Uh, and what you see here, again, are the relative greenhouse gas emissions reduction potential of these different actions with a significant opportunity in building retrofits uh, and also in our zero emissions fleet transition. And so a similar summary uh, for our corporate action shows that within the corporate space where we have more control, we have the potential to reduce our emissions 100% by 2050 achieve an energy savings of 56%. And if we choose to move forward with an ambitious renewable energy program on county facilities, offset entirely our energy costs. 
So in terms of next steps and recent activities, the recommendation uh, in the report, as uh, Chair Carlton mentioned, uh, is quite long and includes a number of components. Uh, one is to join over 500 Canadian municipalities in declaring a climate emergency. And I think it's important to note that this idea of declaring a climate emergency is not something that evokes the emergency or disaster measures. This is simply something to express the severity of the global climate crisis um, and that Gray County is serious in moving forward with this climate action plan in response. Uh, it also recommends initiating work plans for each of the five key next steps uh, and bringing forward any necessary resource requests through the annual budget process. We know we need to continue to improve data collection and analysis over time. And critically importantly, to continue to work with all member municipalities on their climate action planning work and also implementation activities, as there's much great work already happening across the municipalities of Gray County. A few recent activities that are already underway that we wanted to highlight before wrapping up for questions. Uh, we are already working with some neighboring jurisdictions on a electric vehicle charging study to understand where the best locations for fast electric chargers would be across Gray. Um, we were successful in a recent grant application to ICLE Canada. Uh, we were selected out of a competitive process to receive $15,000 to develop a climate engagement and volunteer program. Uh, you'll be receiving or will be receiving a research project from University of Guelph students around green development standards to start moving that work forward. Uh, and in the Rockwood Terrace redevelopment project, uh, there was a net zero feasibility study uh, requirement. So we will soon have a good understanding of what net zero could look like in a long-term care setting. And finally, there is also through the fleet review, uh, a green fleet component to that review that will be coming back to council to help understand how the county's fleets can be decarbonized and contribute to our overall emission reductions pathway. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll thank you again for your time and stop sharing my screen. Uh, and I know that we're happy to take questions. Thank you, Linda. Excellent report. I'll turn it over to committee for questions or comments. Go ahead, Councillor Gamble. You're muted, Brian. Yeah, there we'll get things rolling. Uh, I guess I have to be considered probably a, a skeptic a wee bit. I, I believe we have a problem. I, I don't think in any deli that we don't, but I just see it being very, very ambitious. And I don't think we can achieve, and I know a few people will think different probably, but I don't think we can achieve what we're asking you people to, to get us. Uh, I know I'm in the agriculture business and uh, your figures don't jive with what the agriculture community is saying. Uh, uh, they're saying our the carbon issue is seven to eight percent, and you you on the plan is saying sixty five percent. So there's quite a discrepancy there, and that's got to be ironed out. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, the plan is saying we we've got to get to lower uh, grown you know food substance or uh, sources. And the smaller sources won't supply the food that we're going to need in Canada. We know that. So, you know, I have to think, how are we going to produce the food that's needed to feed the people by using the plan we have in place here now? Uh, I'm not saying we don't need a plan, but I, I just don't see where we're going to be able to feed the population. And I'll, just one more thing here. Uh, the charging stations are made basically in the cities. And uh, the rural area is not seeing any of that and how are we going to get on board with that uh, it's going to be a, a big issue I know uh, the biggest problem we have with the agriculture community is is batteries and we all know that uh, you know the the idea for EVs is is batteries and and we do not because of our climate it's very cold batteries do not survive that well and uh, and I know we found it last winter with the number that we do have around that they, they're just not as practical as they look like. So anyway, I'll leave you with that. And thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Is there any response from staff on that? Anything you want to comment? Um, 
Thank you so much uh, through the chair, Councillor Gamble. Uh, in terms of the, uh, I guess, contribution of different sectors to the overall emissions, absolutely. Uh, the Gray County profile uh, is somewhat different from the national or provincial profile uh, because we have uh, a relatively low population at around 100,000. Um, we actually have twice that number of, of ruminant uh, livestock. And so it does mean that compared to the national numbers, there is a higher contribution from agriculture. But again, what we've seen through this work is that it also means that we have a real opportunity that many other places in Canada don't have, uh, where agriculture is a key part of the solution, where it, through all kinds of different agricultural practices, many of them already happening across Grey County, there's an opportunity to uh, both reduce emissions and also potentially realize revenue um, through carbon offsetting programs programs that look to reward agricultural practices, which can be very large scale uh, for choosing lower carbon uh, approaches. One more comment. Uh, with that, uh, I know uh, the agriculture community, is, as I probably said before, is, is quite involved in this and they're, they're doing a lot of things that the normal population doesn't see or know about. And one of them is, is introducing carbon flicks into the soil to, uh, but it comes at a high cost and agriculture community is ready to embrace that. But we, you know, they, unless there's a, a profit at the end of the day, why would you do it? Uh, you know, it's, there has to be some involvement of other, other sources in this too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And if there is no other comments, I'll go to Deputy Warden McQueen, please. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and, and thanks for the report. Certainly uh, gets us all thinking and talking about where we want to go, for sure. Certainly, there's going to be some growing pains as we go along. And uh, But just before I get to my question, I was going to raise this going back to the agriculture side. Uh, as we see, just in the sense, it's, it's a major investment for equipment, and it's a lot of capital cost does, uh, and to change you know, tractor design and tractor, it's, you know, I think some of us have tractors that are 50 years old still running around the farm and, and that type of thing, but not in a, not in a high production matter, but it does, the diesel engine is sort of what's the workhorse of the agricultural side. And it will take time to, you know, from investment of changes to what that looks like. But uh, just in the sense of, of, of agriculture, as we see the crop value has gone up, but then all of a sudden the input costs go up with fuel and, and fertilizer. So at the end of the day, it's tough for the agricultural side, plus the increased cost of equipment and all that stuff. So I'm not going to get into that uh, dynamics of, of that or any other business, but that there is a lot of challenges that do incorporate. But I think on the other side of that, there's probably opportunity, as you're saying, Linda, with regards to carbon offsetting, which I think needs to, it has to be a revenue uh, uh, somewhere there has to be a revenue channel that does create that investment money to to look at changes, and uh, I think there's going to be opportunity in in renewables uh, on the uh, agricultural side as well. Uh, you know, maybe in small renewables for those new electric charging units, whatever they are, whether it's smaller wind uh, devices or or even solar or however, because uh, I always look at, uh, you know, one thing with agriculture, it has the mass or the base to, to create those opportunities where you're living in a, an individual living in a condo, you don't have that availability, availability to charge or, or to generate. So I think there's going to be opportunity there as well. And what that looks like is still, it's going to have to be developed, but uh, certainly that I think will have to be a very important part of embracing agriculture to create other revenue streams or other opportunities for the agricultural base or the land base to create those opportunities. And I think that has to go hand in hand as we move forward on to get full buy-in or to get that transition that's uh, as moving forward. The other comment I was going to raise, as we know, and it's with regards to the suggestion in your, in your motion about uh, going from a climate crisis to a climate emergency, I know we've just came out of an emergency of two years and, and I think originally, and I know you made the comment that it's not considered the same as an emergency of, of, of that nature from 
you know, the sky is falling or something like that. But I think we have to be careful around the word emergency only from the fact is if it gets watered down, I shouldn't say watered down. Don't, uh, maybe that's not the right word. It's just, I have had some comments to, to say that I know some municipalities have declared emergency and okay, if you have an emergency, then you have to have a plan of action. But if that plan of action is over 30 years, is that necessarily an emergency or is that just, you know, the crisis? I'm not trying to get critical. I'm just saying that some of the comments that people look at and how you use that word emergency, because generally if, you know, like just in a brief sense of, of a example we've had where we've had a tornado go through our municipality, we have had a huge fire, it's an emergency, the roads are closed, this happens, this happens, then you have a plan of action, you deal with it. And, you, and so if that's the route, we need to go, I think there needs to be a little context around why is it being called an emergency and the context around, you know, around that. So I think there's going to have to be some communication because again, people tend to look at an emergency. If you watch the news, hey, there's an emergency or it just, I, I bring that up just more as for a conversation than to be critical. And I don't, but I have had people raise that to me is, you know, is it, you know, I know it's an, it's an issue. I know it's a concerning. And certainly to some people, it is a, a drastic emergency. We need to change the, the emissions of the one and a half to 2% degree change in or where we're going. So I bring that up for discussion purposes at this point. And uh, it just, I think, we and, and I think maybe that's the part of just the last two years, people have really played on that part. And as we know, as we've had it declared for two years, people start to wonder, okay, <laughs> so I just bring that up as a context of, of discussion, not to be critical, but just in the sense of some of the comments that have been raised to me. Thank you. Thank you. And CAO Wingrove, I see your hand is up. Thanks so much. And I, I, I just want to respond to um, the comments that, that uh, Deputy Ward McQueen has made, because I think you're, you're absolutely right that this, this is the question that we need this council to answer, that all of us as individual citizens need to answer. Is this an emergency? Is this something that needs to or deserves to have our full attention and, and us putting whatever efforts we can muster against it? Or is it not? And I think that what we hear time and time and time again is that the opportunity to take half measures or you know recognize it but not really do anything about it or whatever it that window is quickly closing and so i think it's important to for this council to decide whether or not you want to call it an emergency and treat it like an emergency or whether you don't, because that will inform uh, staff's priority setting and um, the, you know, how quickly we want to move forward with the initiatives that are included in this plan, and you know, just the the priority that we want to give to this. So I really hope that whatever we decide, we can get behind it, and and then that will give staff the 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 mandate the appropriate mandate to be able to um, make decisions and move forward. So thank you for raising that. Thank you for those comments. Warden Hicks, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and uh, Linda, thank you for this report. And it seems like uh, every time you speak, I, I learn just a little bit uh, more, maybe a lot more. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're very lucky to have you uh, on our team. and. Uh, I keep learning from you. Um, in terms of the comment that just came up about emergency, in short, for me, it's an emergency. Um, on the agricultural uh, comments, and I really like the way that you position that, that it's not about blame, it's about recognizing, uh, you know, taking inventory and where we are, and, and it really presents an opportunity uh, for us to work with the agricultural uh, community to address uh, the issue, and it's, it's not a blame thing at all. And in fact, the agricultural community is stepping up uh, to the plate and has uh, many uh, very good initiatives in place. I mean, I think, you know, enterprising people could probably find 
uh, solutions directed solely at agriculture? You know, is there an opportunity for us to look at, you know, um, Deputy Warden McQueen was talking about, you know, wind. I mean, how are we going to get the, the battery um, generating infrastructure in place for agriculture? Because they're not going to drive a tractor uh, down to that charging station. Uh, so, um, you know, what, what, is, what is that uh, solution for agriculture? And on the, um, the targets, um, I can see that the comparators and the real numbers that we're looking at is the community targets. But Linda, you present community targets and then the corporate uh, target. So let me start with the corporate, um, uh, the corporate target. I see that we, we are targeting 40% by 2030 and net zero by 2050. Would it be possible, given that you say, you know, we're less than 1% or about 1%, would it be possible for us to have a corporate target that's even more aggressive? Uh, and I, I, I pose this uh, merely as to say, you know, what if? What if that target were 40% uh, by 2030, but the net uh, zero by 2040? <coughs> um, what would that mean? Uh, what would it take? Uh, to have, because I would love to see us be more aggressive. I mean, I, I get it that the community target will take, you know, collaboration and cooperation and a lot more uh, work. But when we get to control the corporate uh, target a lot more. That's in-house. We, we control that. So could we be more aggressive? Could we say by 2040? Um, so that's one question. And secondly, with respect to the community targets, I, I, I like where it's at, 30%. Uh, by 2030 and at zero by 2050. But I wonder why do we have such big gaps? Like, could we not have uh, five year uh, targets instead of saying, you know, 30, 40, 50? Um, so I wonder if you might comment on those two things. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Go uh, ahead, Linda. Uh, through the chair, thank you, Warden. Um, so for the for the corporate target, I, I think the idea of, of maintaining the 2030 target at 40% is wise because some of the, the pieces that went into that is the availability of technology. Um, you know, we're looking at some fleet replacements or that the fleet team are looking at some fleet replacements. And we'd love, we'd love to have an electric snowplow tomorrow and they just aren't out there. They're just not available. Um, and so there's the, the level of ambition and investment, and then there's also the available technologies. But in terms of the ability to accelerate the net zero target, given the, the direction we see happening um, through other jurisdictions, I think there is an opportunity there. But I may also ask uh, uh, Randy or uh, uh, Kim to chime in on that. Um, and on your second question around interim targets, that's absolutely possible. We've sort of, we've taken those targets directly from uh, the pathway that you saw on that, that, that diagram of the actions. And so we could certainly pull from that same pathway interim goals. So we would have more frequent check-ins. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Randy, over to you. Yeah, just further to what Linda indicated, um, you know, as, as Linda noted, technology is a bit of a barrier in terms of trying to achieve some of these targets. And we think that technology will uh, continue to change and, and uh, provide opportunities to be able to uh, look at more aggressive targets. There are some things, though, on the corporate side um, that the county could look at doing in terms of um, and start looking at as part of our capital funding programs um, to be able to start retrofitting, uh, providing, you know, solar, uh, doing some further feasibility assessment, net zero feasibility assessments on our current builds uh, and our existing buildings in terms of looking at opportunities to be able to offset that. And so that's something that I think that could be even part of an overall first step is what is possible and then coming back to council with here's what it could cost if we wanted to try to achieve that by 2040 this is the cost by 2050 this is what that would cost so i think that's something in terms of next steps that we could consider and build in as part of our capital budgets uh in terms of looking at that if if council's interested in obviously in looking at uh, a more aggressive pathway of achieving net zero which 
you know, if uh, providing that information to council, I think is, is would be part of the first step in terms of quantifying what that looks like. Um, we don't have those exact numbers at this stage, but that's something that we could explore further. Also with that, and I think Linda mentioned this through her presentation, we, we've we noted that the county can't do this on our own, right? In terms of implementing this action plan, we need federal and provincial partners uh, to be able to, uh, through funding supports, to be able to move forward with these, these actions. And if there's funding supports uh, for uh, retrofitting uh, municipal buildings and, and uh, to achieve uh, uh, net zero and energy efficiencies, that is going to help uh, the county uh, move forward sooner rather than later if that funding support is is sufficient enough to to move forward right so so that's where i guess the the bit of the balance in terms of hoping that those programs are going to uh, exist and move forward based on the federal target of wanting to achieve across canada uh, net zero by 2050 we're hoping that then there's funding opportunities uh, that's going to be provided to municipalities and, and others to be able to move forward with uh, retrofit programs and other things that, that Linda described earlier. So, so the level of ambition will be based on you know, technology, level of funding, and uh, but I think one of the first next steps would be to try to quantify that the best we can for council so that you're aware of what that means and the difference between say a 2040 net zero and a 2050 net zero. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Warden McQueen, go ahead. Sure, I just have to get myself off mute. We could talk about this all day and, and I think there's a lot of, uh, I wanna start off, my glass is always half full. So I think there's a lot of ways that we can achieve what we want to achieve. We just gotta have, if we don't have the answer, we need to look for the answer. I mean, leaders lead. That's part of what we are, is what we do. And so I think initiatives and incentives, I think Gray County could be leaders in a lot of different things. I was just thinking here, you know, out in Alberta, a lot of agricultural areas had a oil well. What would be wrong with it? And maybe this changes with planning as time goes on. If farmers have are generating power, that they have a charging center out in the front of, in front of their farm. I don't know. Is that is that possible? We have to look at ways of changing it because as they say right now the electrification is going to take time and we need to create more opportunity for for um charging or more opportunity to create generation and and uh, so i think that's one piece of that because we don't want it to fail i mean this is as a society we don't want it to to fail but you know right now with the price of gas at a dollar 70 it's driving it faster now than it was just because it's all about the pocketbook Right. It's what, you know, you start to look at what's your cost, what's your alternatives. And I think right now there just not, there just isn't enough electric vehicles out there to, to calm the demand. And we, we, you can see that, but we see a lot of announcements just more recently in the past week, charging you know, GM yesterday, looking at, so, you know, what, 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 what really motivates things is the price. And, uh, I, and I think looking at it in, in a positive sense, look at the last two years that, that COVID has, we're having our meeting here from Zoom. Well, if we all drove to the to the uh, own town, where is the emissions? You know, I think those are something that we can also use as emissions, uh, the savings that we're doing from having those type of uh, meetings and stuff, what we're saving, because I don't think right now it's being captured and, and it is saving, it is, you know, all those things. So there's, it's, it's all about the positiveness. I think moving forward is, is how we need to move forward, uh, with this. And I think great County, I think can be leaders in a lot of different ways. And I think we have to look at, uh, being proactively with other governments to create opportunities for private and, and, and the, uh, uh, municipal or, or public sector. We just have to be very um, aggressive, I think, in that part. I know being at the annual conference back in 2017, uh, Canada's 150, I uh, had a tour of electric bus. There was, uh, again, Deputy War or Mr. Warden, we, I think you you and I've talked about this, where there has, there was a number of uh, discussions around electric buses and stuff. I remember having conversations, they were testing snow plows and electric snow uh, electric truck snow plows and garbage trucks in alberta or in edmonton because of the cold is uh as councillor gamble said is we do live in a colder climate and 
and those are things that you have to <laughs> you have to be on your game and and uh, you know for those what ifs and that type of thing. So anyway, it's I think the price of fuel and the and and that along with other uh, ways we we look for the future, I think will drive that innovation and and will drive that to a certain degree. And I saw it back in if you remember two thousand and eight where there was a huge change, the price of gas got to about a buck 45. I know personally ourselves, we changed, I bought a Honda Civic just because of the price of fuel and everything else. So you make those changes. And, and I think North America as a whole made that change after 2008, 2009, just as a, as a whole. So we have, you do see certain trends that do change to a certain degree, but uh, you, I think it's all in, in the discussion and the communication and, and, and the part of how you're delivering that message and, and the incentives and, you know, like they always say, a, a carrot is better than a stick. So if there's incentives, you know, I think that the, the, the devastating thing that happened with electric vehicles was four years ago when the provincial government canceled those incentives. Uh, it was working, right? And, and uh, I know there's still the federal incentive in that, but, you know, there needs to be incentives. And that, where that's captured, I think, was supposed to be coming from that carbon tax that was supposed to be covering those incentives, right? So you got to have some incentives to make that move. But uh, certainly I understand from Madam CEO where you have to make a decision that sets the bar and you move forward. And I that's, again, part of us as leaders, leaders lead, and that's what we are challenged to do, right? So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Are there any other comments from committee? Warden Hicks, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to come back to this um, uh, this target, the corporate uh, target, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit like a dog with a bone, I suppose. I really like, maybe I'm focusing too much on the visual, but I really like that while the community target is 30% uh, by 2030, we are 40% by 2030. And I would love to see that net zero uh, target be above what we're expecting from the community target. So I'd love to us to visually uh, be able to say that we're, we're absolutely committed to being leaders. Uh, so we're gonna be ahead of the community target. Um, I, you know, even if it's five years, I mean, I would just like to say that we, we're taking this thing uh, seriously. We're committed to doing uh, what is necessary. We're gonna, we're gonna be leaders uh, and we're gonna be ahead of the, of the community as a corporation. So for me, I would love to see that 2050 change to something sooner than 2050 on the corporate target side. Thank you for those comments. Is there anything else from committee? Then I would just like to state, um, thank you very much for all the comments. I had brought up with um, Randy and Linda last week when we talked to agenda review about the emergency. So thank you everyone for the clarification on that. I think it is important that we declare an emergency. Um, my concern had been partly what I think Deputy Warden McQueen was saying, does this shut everything down until we have dealt with it or is it, are we just giving it priority? You may be sat in in the same seminar at a conference three years ago that I did that I don't remember which one it was, but someone had declared an emergency at that time and pretty much got their municipality shut down until they dealt with it. So we don't want to do that, but we do want to give it priority. Another question I have, and this just occurs to me, it occurred to me yesterday, I have a little Milwaukee chainsaw that's battery operated and I was using it yesterday. And it's a handy little tool to have, but I need two battery packs because you wear one out and then you have to recharge. So I wonder at how that works for a crew out on the road. How many battery packs do they have to carry with them? And how many charging stations do you need for battery packs just for one saw to get through a day? And I mean, Milwaukee has them in weed whackers and you name it. There's all different tools. The second part of that is, what do you do with the old gas powered ones? I've got two or three old gas powered chainsaws sitting in my barn. Probably nobody wants them anymore, but what do you do with that technology? What's the effect on the environment from that? And has that been looked at as part of this climate change is 
what effect does that have on our landfills or wherever this old technology goes? So just some further thoughts that I have there. And I think before we started, I should have asked for a mover and seconder to put the motion on the floor, but I forgot until we were part way through. So if I could have a mover to put the motion on the floor, Warden Hicks and a seconder. Councillor Gamble. And is there any further discussion that we need to have or are we ready for me to call the motion? Are we voting or, okay, Deputy Warden McQueen, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. You do raise a really good point because there's, a, you know, that question about what happens to the old technology is just still going to be, I mean, there's a lot of people that collect old cars. There's a lot of people that do a lot of things that are, you know, like we're still making the gas powered engine. I mean, that, I think that was where I thought it's going to take time for the investment change. And that's what I was referring to in the agriculture side. I mean, there's tractors out there that are 40 or 50 years old that are still doing maybe not frontline agricultural work, but they're there to, you know, whether to run a rake or maybe cut some hay or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to use an example where you have, you know, the newer tractors that are your workhorses of your major, you know, but I think that is a good question because I think it's going to be asked, is it going to come to, you know, 30 years from now that there's going to be not one drop of gas left, or is it going to be to the point where it's, you know, you only use that as a, as an antique show on a Sunday at a, at a show, just saying this is what the technology was like. I don't know. That's, that's an excellent point because that transition is going to take time and it may be a, a generation or two before that changes too, right? Is, is that change is not changes. It's, it's new generation that brings that new technology along. And obviously that older stuff, as we want to call it, is, it, you know, recycling, I guess, will be one part of that. We, you know, but you know, there is, there is things that are around that have been around for a hundred years. Uh, I guess there'll be a lot of museums and maybe I don't know, but it is a good, it is a good point to raise. And I think that will be something that there will be that question. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't see that these old chainsaws are going to hit any museum anywhere. I guarantee they're missing parts. Uh, Warren Hicks, you had your hand up or would you like me to go to Linda first? I'm happy that you go to Linda first. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Linda, you had comments? Uh, thank you through the chair. Just very briefly, uh, one of the recommendations throughout the entire plan, not just related to light duty equipment, is that any transition happens at the time of replacement. So just to say we're absolutely not suggesting at any point that we take something that's new or working well and, you know, jettison that to replace it with a zero emissions version. Um, there's, there's enough for us to do that we can start by looking at equipment or assets at the time of upgrade or replacement and at that point look to, to trans to exchange for a lower carbon option um, and specifically uh, on the light duty equipment so things like chainsaws and lawnmowers there was actually a, a webinar back in February that the clean air partnership put on and there's a number of pilot projects in Ontario at the moment where um, the city of I believe Mississauga is piloting uh, electric lawnmowers and different light duty trade-offs so we certainly will have lots of peers that we can learn from in that area. Excellent. Thank you. Warden Hicks, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, no, no, I, I'm sorry. May I go? Yes. Thank you. Um, I think that's a good point, uh, Linda. We would treat that equipment no different than how we're treating cars, right? Because many of us are saying, geez, uh, my car is working fine. I'm going to continue to drive my vehicle at the point of uh, replacement. That's the time that I'm going to consider you know, perhaps uh, an electric uh, vehicle. Same thing with our, our tools and chainsaws and whatnot. Um, but on the motion, I don't want to vote against the motion, <laughs> but I, I, I very much want that 2050 <laughs> corporate target uh, date to be something less than 2050. Uh, so help me out here. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to put, you know, perhaps you don't have the information today as staff to tell us whether or not changing from 2050 to 2045 even uh, might be, would it, you know, 
is that something that we're picking a date? We just don't know. We don't have the information to really say whether 2045 uh, would be achievable. I just want to be able to say that we are going to be leaders and uh, we're setting our corporate target uh, ahead of the target for uh, the community. Uh, and so help me with that. Uh, you know, can we need to uh, come back? Uh, and let you give us that, those numbers, or if we pick 2045 today, is that a number that we can realistically um, uh, live with? Uh, I just don't know, help me there. I'm wondering, Warden Hicks, if we have a slight amendment that perhaps asks staff to report back on the feasibility of doing that, of changing that, because I don't think we wanna make a change that we lock ourselves into that's not achievable. And that was actually another point that you made that I've thought of all along is what about having set goals so that by 2035, we've reached a certain point by 2040 so that it's measurable. You know, that 20 year time span, it seems like we're going from a little bit, it's just too big is the way I see it. So I'm wondering if there's something we could do there. And I see Councillor Gamble has his hand up. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm playing in my mind here what, uh, uh, what has been said. Um, I, I don't like the word emergency. Uh, it probably is, and we understand that more than a lot of people, but uh, I, I like the idea of it's an issue of concern. I, I don't think we have the answers. And, and to go out and preach to people that it's an emergency, we, we, we need answers. And, and I don't see that we do have I, I, I mean, you're doing a good job of getting us there, but we're not there. And that's what's really concerning me. Thank you. Good. Thank you. I'm wondering, CAO Wingrove, you mentioned that declaring an emergency sets it up higher on a priority list for staff. Is that um, of significant importance, that wording to keep it at a high level priority? so that it can be dealt with um, before other smaller issues? I thank you, Chair Carlton. I, I think that's entirely entirely fair that yes, when, when we are, you know, you, I'm sure everyone around the table in your own municipalities deals with, you know, conflicting priorities and, and needing to make really difficult decisions all the time. And where we've established a clear precedent uh, or precedence um, of one initiative over another that just makes it, um, I think, more transparent and clear for for ourselves, but also for the public that um, that this is something that that we've agreed is of the highest priority. And so there is that aspect of it as well. So not only are you sending a message to staff, but you're sending a message to the public and. And I think that we need to consider carefully how important it is to, to communicate that to the public as well. Thank you. And I'll refer maybe to Heather and Tara as to how we word this. Um, do we do an amendment or how do we word that? Uh, thank you, Chair Carlton. Um, I wonder, and, and Randy and Linda um, can certainly um, point me in the right direction. The second last clause points to um, directing staff to continue and expand work supporting all of the actions. And my understanding is this is going to be a living document that is going to be uh, revised and, and redeveloped over time as the engagements with our local municipalities and our community stakeholders begin and move forward. So I'm wondering if it, where Warden Hicks you're going is going to be included in these updated work plans as the work gets going with our, our stakeholders and, and um, municipal uh, peers that we will be able to review and bring back some adjusted targets based on those communications and um, changes that are happening in the industry. Randy, am I on the right track there? Yeah, I have, it, for sure. It's 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 uh, a living document. It's something that we'll need to revisit, similar to how we revisit official plans, say every every few years, uh, to make sure that we're um, 
on track to meet the targets, that the actions are still, um, you know, uh, sufficient in order to get us to the targets, uh, that there's new technology changes that could come about in the next few years that we want to make sure that, you know, we're incorporating into our plan as we, as we move forward. Um, so it is no doubt going to be a living document uh, that will change over time. I'm wondering, um, and, and again, just looking at maybe the third, the third clause, uh, the third last clause, sorry, of the motion, uh, where it talks about the emissions, um, maybe a, a, an amendment a recommended amendment there to that uh, the, the climate change action plan the net zero greenhouse gas emission targets by 2050 uh, and staff are directed to explore the option of uh, a more aggressive corporate target. Um, and I don't know what year you want to put that in, but but I'm wondering if there's some wording in there that to to recommend revisions to that third last clause that uh, in terms of where I think the warden's trying to get to. Warden Hicks, go ahead. Would that um, work for what you're looking for? Yeah, I, I'm comfortable with Clause 6 uh, because that's talking about the community target, I believe, right? Uh, uh, where I'm uh, suggesting the change is the 2050 with respect to the corporate target. I want us to be more aggressive um, and uh, and be showing leadership on the on the corporate side. So I like the 2050 uh, goal, which I think paragraph uh, six or number six is uh, reflecting. That's the community target. But how do we address that? I would really love to see us um, set a stronger. Uh, more. Anyways, I'm repeating myself. It's on the corporate side. I want to see some change. Right. So that would be in that third last paragraph where the change would get implemented that because it is that one specifically says be endorsed to help guide corporate strategic plans and priorities. Ah, so is, is number six referring to Linda is number six referring to the, to the corporate uh, goal or is it referring to the community goal. Because I, I, I think what I see is we have to do some things in the corporation uh, to achieve our community goals. And so I really saw number six is setting 2050 as a community goal. Uh, through the chair, I think uh, what you're surfacing is that there is an opportunity for more clarity in clause six. Um, and at the moment it's referring, I think, to both corporate and community as they share the net zero goal. Um, it isn't distinguishing between the two as at the moment they're aligned. Yeah. yeah. And, and, sorry, Randy. And the other piece was uh, that still that recommendation about can we piece it out a little bit more in five year increments? Where would we put that? I think that could be also built in as part of a, 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 a re recommended revision to that that clause that that staff be directed to explore uh, the option of of a more aggressive target uh, for the corporate emissions um, prior to 2050 um, and that um, and that staff also explore uh, targets in five-year increments or something to that effect and maybe Heather or Tara can help with with wording but I think I think it is that six that six clause that I think that could has the potential to be slightly revised to I think reflect where the warden's going. Heather, go ahead, please. Um, so just, for, I'm, I'm putting it out for discussion before it's actually moved and seconded because I do see that Councillor McQueen has his hand up as well. Um, but what uh, an amended motion could look like is that the sixth uh, clause of the motion be amended to reflect that staff be directed to explore more aggressive corporate targets. Would that suit what you're looking for, Warden Hicks? Yeah, I'd be happy with that. A, a more aggressive corporate target, but also to indicate that we're committed to the 2050 target for the community side. Uh, and also um, uh, that staff be directed to, um, well, 
to implement five-year uh, increment uh, targets instead of the current 10. Okay. Okay, and can I go to Deputy Warden McQueen? I'm yes. sorry, you had your hand up for a few minutes. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good discussion. Um, I understand there's probably a, a realistic target and a preferred target. And maybe those targets keep getting updated as technology. Because I look at technology. I'm going to throw a couple things in here. Uh, JFK said we're going to put a man in the moon in the 60s. They did because they were driven to do that. So if, 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 if the society is we have are driven, it, it'll happen. Or it'll happen in a, in a way that, that will make it happen. I look back on technology in the past. I mean, 2008, we had a hybrid uh, electric vehicle. That technology has been around for for quite a long time. That that technology. You look at the BlackBerry 2008. You look at the iPhone or smartphones 20 years ago or 10 years ago, 2012. We all, you know, you look back at technology, how things have changed. Technology has to drive this innovation to make these targets. And as as you change technology, you have what they call learning curves or, or trial by error. And as we know, we have seen that in technology as well, things get developed, you know, and that, so I guess realistically, and, you know, maybe Pat or somebody has some ideas on the, on the transportation side, you know, is there a, is there a municipality out there that has electric snowplow or electric garbage truck? You know, it's got to start somewhere and then you start to develop that technology and then it starts to be mass produced and, and, and all that stuff. So. I, I don't disagree where you want to go, uh, Mr. Warden. It's just, I think we have to be realistic in the sense of this is the preferred, this is the, the target, but this is the preferred target. Maybe that preferred target gets updated, like you said, every five years or maybe every two years or maybe every year it's updated to see where the technology has enabled us. And we will get there sooner. Like, I, I don't know. I, 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 you know, I just look at the past of where we've came from to, you know, as technology has, I remember my Sunday school teacher telling me when I was a kid, technology has changed more in the last 25 years than the last hundred years. And that's a long time ago, <laughs> but you know what I mean? How, how we keep evolving and we keep changing things. So it's very possible that that's very realistic, but we don't have that information yet. I think at our hands just to, to really say we can get there, not saying we can't want to get there, and we can keep updating it and, and be aggressive. And, you know, this is the preferred target, but as we get more information, we can update that information. And I think we have to make sure we don't set ourselves up to fail either just because of not knowing. And it's just the unknown that I think we have to be very, but I think optimistically we can talk that and, and say, this is the preferred target or this is where we would like to get to. I know that helps Madam Chair for conversations wise or I think that helps somewhat. Thank you. Um, so are we asking in that sixth paragraph to change it to being 2045 for the corporate or for staff to research how feasible that would be? That we want to aim for that target, but that if it's not feasible, let's not set us, ourselves up for failure. Warden Hicks, go ahead, please. Uh, Madam Chair, I really like the language that uh, Randy suggested, uh, which is that uh, staff are going to explore um, an earlier target date for the corporate side. Uh, and, you know, that sort of says we, we're making a commitment to at least look at, at an earlier date there, but we're committed to the 2050 on the uh, community side. Uh, and lastly, just that uh, staff be directed to, um, you know, to implement some five-year uh, targets uh, instead of the current 10. Okay, I'd be happy with that. Thank you. Heather? Um, Taryn and I have been working in the background here. So um, here's what we have drafted that uh, clause six of the motion be amended to reflect that staff be directed to explore more aggressive corporate, corporate targets and staff be directed to implement uh, five-year target reviews rather than the current 10-year increments. And with, with committee's um, indulgence, we may um, work with that a little bit, but that is the general intent of the uh, amendment. 
Yeah, and it is important that paragraph six keep that 2050 date, but uh, yes. indicate that it's for community. Yes, okay, I see uh, Councillor Gamble, you have your hand up. Yes, um, I like the way this is kind of changing somewhat um, because I really, I like what Randy said. I like what Deputy Warden McQueen said. Uh, I think we need to, you know, keep that, all that in mind, but, you know, maybe realistically, there's some of that we're not going to get to. And, you know, it's like, you don't want to hit somebody in the head if they're working with you. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Deputy Warden McQueen. Well, sort of, I just was thinking sort of like a, our strap plan revisit every time we have a term of council it would be better to go with the term of council every four years. So then at the beginning, it's sort of somewhere in that, because then you're sort of following that same cycle as your council members or, or your council in that similar to a strap plan. You know what I mean? Like you're sort of getting in that same cycle every term. So at the beginning of that term or Partway through that, I, I don't know. I don't know. Heather, maybe help me out here, or Madam CEO, just in the sense that you're still saying with that cycling is because you could get a different cycle that could change again, right? If it's, you know, you're, that five years is sort of skipping over. I know we do development charges every five years and that sort of skips over, but I don't know if there's any thought on that in the sense that it's sort of like a reset button or a, I don't know. I just, if there's any feedback on that. Madam CEO. I'm not sure I have that. What, say that again, Paul. I think what um, Deputy Ward McQueen is commenting there, and I've had this thought as well, is that you set it so that this always comes back to council. Oh, sorry, five year, four year thing. Um, yeah. yeah, so I guess there's always that, that need for an, an overlap. With the, the, with the term of council, because a new council comes in, they need a little while to kind of find their feet um, and, and things need to get um, placed on agendas appropriately. So, um, I mean, we, I, so when you make it every four years, it's, you're gonna always be kind of in that, that tipping point where are you asking the, the, current, <laughs> the current council to be doing something with us at the very end of their mandate or um, where I think your intent is to specifically have an incoming council look at it in the first year of their term. Is that maybe the right way to say that? So maybe, um, maybe we just need to say it that way. Does that, does that work? Heather, can we put something together like that? Um, yeah, I was just uh, jotting that down that um, perhaps the last bit of that amendment could be that staff be directed to bring updated target reviews once per term of council. That works. I think so. And we do that in Georgian Bluffs where certain things we have brought back in a second year of council so that new councillors have time to get up to speed on issues before they have to deal with it. So I think that's an excellent idea. Uh, Deputy Warden McQueen, go ahead. Yeah, and I think, thank you, Madam Chair. I think that gives an opportunity for staff to also introduce or, or new council members to introduce there's new technology, there's new ideas, there's new this, I've learned this, and, you know, over in Finland, they're doing this. You know what I mean? It, it allows some uh, new, to, you know, new new ideas, new excitement, new thoughts. You know, we, we go to, you know, each term of council goes to conferences, you learn stuff there. Hey, you bring it back. There's new, you know, it just keeps, just keeps that, it flowing, I think. I think just think it keeps it, it keeps it good that way. So yeah, I support that. Thank you. So any other comments or are we ready to call the question or do we want that complete motion read out um, before we vote? So Madam Chair, you are voting on the amendment first. Okay. Okay, and then we'll have the main motion as amended. Okay, so I need a mover and seconder on the amendment first. It has been moved by Warden Hicks, I believe. Is that for the main motion or for the amendment? The amendment. The amendment. Right. Okay. And if so that my... amendment could just be read once again, because we have amended the amendment. <laughs> yes, for sure. Uh, but uh, 
Clause six of the motion of the motion be amended to reflect that staff be directed to explore more aggressive corporate targets, targets, and that staff be directed to implement uh, bring updated uh, target reviews once per term of council. Everyone, all right with that? Then a seconder for the amendment. Deputy Warden McQueen, all in favor. That is carried. So now we're back to the main motion as amended. Correct. And I need a mover and seconder there or I have them? If the original mover and seconder are fine with that, um, which I think was Warden Hicks and uh, Councillor McCo no, Councillor Gamble, yes. uh, if they're fine with the main motion as amended uh, and they're willing to let their name stand, then that's fine. Okay, are you both willing to, okay. And so we can go ahead and call the question, all in favor. That is carried, thank you. We are on to correspondence. Um, who is speaking to this? I can start uh, that, uh, Chair Carlton. Um, so we received correspondence from a, a, a person who's raised concerns with respect to um, impacts from ATVs on, on uh, the trail, specifically related to, I think, more of the CP rail trail. Um, and also concerned about uh, fossil fuel emissions uh, caused by um, uh, also ATVs and recreational vehicles. Um, in terms of the emissions side, um, I think it's very, it's quite minimal in terms of uh, the emissions on the uh, vehicle portion uh, for recreational vehicles. Um, we know that as, as just speaking back to the technology changes, there's definitely some technology changes. There's actually a new manufacturer in Quebec that's manufacturing electric snowmobiles. Um, we know that uh, ATVs and recreational vehicles will also be um, looking at alternative uh, um, fuels as well or emissions uh, for their vehicles. And uh, so something that I think we'll be continuing to, to monitor. And I think as, as again, as technology increases that um, we'll see some of that transition uh, as well. Um, with that, it's uh, raised some questions in terms of, you know, obviously zeroing in on electric vehicle charging stations for cars and, and vehicles, but also looking at uh, maybe an EV network uh, for recreational vehicles too, and making sure that those are strategically located, not just for uh, cars and and, uh, and trucks, but also looking at uh, maybe strategically locating these charging stations within our trail network as well. So that's uh, something that staff will, uh, of course, continue to explore. In terms of the concerns around the um, impacts to the trail, um, staff are working on a report um, to look at long-term maintenance options with respect to the CP Rail Trail uh, and other trails. So we're gonna be bringing that report forward to either the second meeting in April or the first meeting in May. So, um, so that'll be coming forward to Committee of the Whole to explore that topic further. Um, so at this stage, that's why we're recommending it to just receive this for information. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions in regard to that? Okay, one question that comes up for me, and this really doesn't have to do with this, so bear with me. When I go start my gas truck, I need the battery to start it. It then recharges that battery as I'm running. Is there not technology in place that electric batteries could recharge themselves as they're running? It just is one of those thoughts that keeps occurring to me. Why do we need all these charging stations? Why can't this battery or the technology that's running that little engine recharge itself? So just my thoughts that keeps occurring to me. Um, so we're just receiving, we don't need a motion on this one? Yes, we do. It okay. is to be received for information. Okay, so could I have a motion to that effect to receive that report? or that letter for information? You're just, the motion's on the agenda. You're just looking for a mover and seconder. All right, a mover. Um, Deputy Warden McQueen, did I see your hand up? Okay, and a seconder. Councillor Gamble, any further discussion? I will call the question. Oh, All in favor. Sorry, sorry. Councillor McQueen has a question. 
Yeah, just just a call when I first read this. I know they were talking about uh, through you, Madam Chair. We're talking about this, but I was wondering if they were concerned also about the the section of the trail not being because remember in the budget or the amount that was being budgeted, it was it came in around the same time whether we were going to do the whole part or doing half of it. And I sort of when I first read it, I thought, but I see it's more around the environment. But I always was wondering if it was all, or maybe I'm referring to maybe there was another one that there was concern around you know whether they were going to, to do it right down to Dundalk because I know that when we brought that forward there was a fairly large cost to that and I know there was some discussion around that so I may be confusing this with another course of inform- or correspondence but I remember I saw something about well why wouldn't you do the whole trail not half the trail so I don't know if there was other correspondence that you received on that Randy or not maybe I'm getting confused but I thought there was there was other correspondence on that but uh, anyway I just uh, we see lots of information. It's hard to keep track of it all sometimes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right, uh, Deputy uh, Warden McQueen. I think there was some correspondence regarding questions about um, the length of, of improvements that are going to be occurring this year on the CP Rail Trail. And and as you noted, Council's direction and uh, is to uh, do the remainder of the trail. Um, so that's, uh, that's something that will be moving forward. So it's just over 50... 50 kilometers, I think that's going to be done um, this year. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gamble? Yeah, I, I think Randy addressed that very well. Council has approved to do that. And, you know, the feeling was that we've, we've done so much in the north end and the south has gotten, you know, hasn't happened. So, you know, once in the discussion of the day, I think we, you know, we just decided that let's get it done. We, we, we Said we're going to do it, so let's get it done and move on. So that's my interpretation of what happened. Thank you. I would agree. Randy, go ahead. And and based on that council commitment and and the funding that's going into to improve the the remainder of the trail, that's why staff wanted to bring forward a, a maintenance report in terms of how we plan to move forward with uh, maintaining that that trail. Uh, and working with our, our partners uh, to to maintain that going forward because we want to protect obviously that investment that council's made in that trail. Okay, thank you. Any other comment or can I call the question on this one and we receive it for information? All in favor? That is carried. So the next piece of correspondence is from the Great Lakes since Lawrence City's initiative. And again, this is being received for information. So I should probably have my mover and seconder first before we discuss it. Sorry, Heather. Uh, Could I have a mover? Warden Hicks and Deputy Warden McQueen. Thank you. Any discussion on that item? Seeing no hands, I will call the question then. All in favor of receiving that for information. That is carried. Thank you. Is there any other business? Seeing none. Next meeting dates to be determined. Can I have someone move adjournment, please? Councillor Gamble and Deputy Warden McQueen. All in favor. Thank you, that's carried. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay, have a good day.